Hello, and welcome to the BNP Paribas Asset Management Talking Heads podcast. Every week, Talking Heads will bring you in-depth insight and analysis through the lens of sustainability on the topics that matter to investors. In this episode, we'll be discussing investing in real estate debt. I'm Daniel Morris, Chief Market Strategist, and I'm delighted to be joined by our Head of Real Estate Debt, Christophe Montserrisier. Welcome, Christophe, and thanks for joining me. Well, very nice to be with you, uh, Daniel. Thanks. Of course, it's been a challenging, interesting uh, start to the year. We're now coming up to the six-month mark. We've had to deal with repeatedly uh, above expectations inflation, expectations for the future level of policy rates, both in the Eurozone and the U.S. rising, uh, and alongside that, rising risks and worries of a recession. So an environment, clearly, that's been quite challenging uh, for equities, but but also for fixed income uh, as rates, and particularly real rates, uh, have risen. And given the poor performance that we've seen in publicly traded assets, uh, understandably, investors are looking for alternatives uh, and places where they think their investments will hopefully provide a somewhat better return than they've seen in bonds and equities. Which brings us uh, to real estate debt, Christoph. So we're in this environment, uh, at least for a while, of rising interest rates, uh, inflation that's high but hopefully falling, and again, worries about growth. When we take that mix, what do you see the impact of all of that on the property sector? Well, uh, although a rising interest rate can be seen as potentially impacting property yields, historically, there is no direct and immediate link between the two. And I remember in the 90s, I had experienced double-digit interest rates with property yields, which were as low as 3 to 4%. Now, when looking at the, uh, the, the, the movement on the market, the recent ones, since the beginning of 2022, the 10-year French government bond yield has evolved from 0.2% to 2%. Investment grade corporate bonds from 09 to 2% and high yield bonds from 36 to 5.3%. So we are very far from the previous situation mentioned. And many properties still trade at a premium, even if reduced as compared to say uh, a year ago. Now, the other thing is that rising interest rates are usually linked with re-ignition of inflation. And for real estate, this also means that rents should increase thanks to the indexation mechanism. The question then is the financial strength of the tenants. This is where a quality of credit analysis comes into play and is favored within an entity such as ours. Now, the other thing that we think about, I guess, slightly longer term, uh, we certainly don't want to and can't forget the pandemic and some of the really deep structural changes uh, that's had upon society, upon the economy. And we think about how demand will evolve in the future. Clearly, we're not all coming to the office the way we did in the past. We perhaps want to live in different parts of the country than we did before. What do you see of some of these longer term impacts uh, on the property sector? because of the pandemic? Yeah, look, I mean, the the, the pandemic, Daniel, has uh, increased the speed at which the structural changes in the real estate markets are taking place. And there is not one real estate market, but several markets. And let me give you one example, which relates to office space. As you mentioned, how is working from home impacting the demand for office space? Well, I think there are two opposite effects which are taking place. The first one is less space is required, as one to two days per week at home is becoming the norm. More space, on the other hand, per head is required because there is a need to accommodate the flexibility and a need for meetings face-to-face with social interactions while in the office. Net-net, there will be less demand for office space, probably 10 to 20%, but that will be over a period of 10 years, given the, the lease structures. In parallel, corporates will want to stay in or to relocate to central business districts with easy access, as it will be more and more difficult to attract talents in the younger generation. So hence, our views is that secondary offices, less well-located and deserved, less flexible, less performant from an ESG standpoint, will be less desired. Selectivity is key when investing, and it's down to the management team. 
So you talked about making workplaces attractive to younger generations, uh, and certainly ESG is a big part of that, having buildings that are environmentally friendly, having work environments uh, that hopefully achieve some of the ESG goals that we all have. What are some of the things you think about when you look at investments uh, and particularly how they can be positive for the environment? ESG is taken into account seriously in our investment process. All our funds are eligible to Article 8 in uh, our F SFDR. Let me just give you one example of an investment we have made, which is uh, ESG friendly. Uh, we have participated in the financing of the construction of a solid wood office campus built from cross-laminated timber, uh, which was a green project with almost zero carbon emission. Now, by using solid wood and geothermal uh, energy to cover up to 80% of the campus heating and cooling needs, the campus carbon footprint over its life cycle is divided by two compared to traditional buildings of recent design. The campus was labeled BBCA Excellent, which is the highest level of environmental certification delivered by the Low Carbon Development Association. Uh, so this is one example, and we have set quantitative targets uh, when we invest uh, in our funds to make sure that we uh, provide financing to the top 30% of the most efficient properties in the market. Christoph, we talked a little bit or touched on uh, the impact of rising interest rates on, on real estate debt, but of course, alongside that are the concerns about growth, uh, credit quality deterioration, and so on. So how do you look at real estate debt as an investment in that type of environment? Investing in real estate debt is both defensive and attractive. Uh, defensive because the risk profile is reduced. There is a significant equity cushion ahead of debt. We only provide between 50 and 75% of the value of a property in debt, depending on the strategy. As a consequence, the equity cushion amounts to 40 to 50% in senior debt strategy and between 20 and 40% uh, for a junior debt strategy. Investors, in addition, also benefit from indexed revenues, indexation mechanism throughout all European countries where we invest in, unable to capture inflation and to increase rental revenues used to pay for interest and amortization. But it is also an attractive investment strategy. Target yield varies between Euribor three months plus 2.4% for a senior debt strategy, which is 100% based on floating rates, and 6.5 to 7.5% gross return for a junior uh, investment strategy. All floating rate loans will benefit from any interest rise as and when your eyeball three months enters into positive territories. That's very clear. Uh, if I can summarize then some of the key points that you made, uh, I've started out by highlighting the rising interest rate environment and the worries about a slowdown in growth, but you pointed out, number one, that the link between interest rates and property yields isn't so uh, direct. Uh, and in fact, a higher inflation environment like the one we're in today is actually positive for rents uh, due to indexation. And even with economic growth slowing, real estate debt uh, remains both defensive and attractive as an asset class in this environment. If we think about some of the longer term perspectives for property, uh, particularly when we think about COVID, uh, you pointed out an interesting contrast in terms of the impact on, say, office space. On one hand, uh, you anticipate less demand because not everyone's going into the office the way we did in the past. Uh, but offsetting that, uh, companies will need more space for the people that are there. Uh, and nonetheless, companies will continue to want to be located uh, in city centers that have easy access, given that uh, people will be still coming into the office. And then finally, you highlighted the importance of ESG considerations and that you have financial targets uh, so that you take into account the environmental impacts of the investments that you make. Well, Christoph, thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us. Thanks for letting me join you, uh, Daniel. That's it for this week's episode of Talking Heads. If you would like more information, please reach out to your BNP Paribas Asset Management contact or check out our Investors Corner blog. We recommend subscribing to Talking Heads on your favorite podcast channel. You'll receive your podcast episode every Monday afternoon. 
If you like the podcast, please leave us a positive review and a nice rating. You've been listening to the BNP Paribas Asset Management Talking Heads podcast with me, Daniel Morris, and Christophe Montserrisier. Please do join us next week. Until then, take care. This podcast presentation includes a discussion on current market events and is not intended as investment advice or an offer of products or services by BNP Paribas Asset Management. Please keep in mind that the information and analysis in this presentation is only current as of the publication date.